So glad that you can make it here today in our 11 a.m. service. If you, this is your first time, my name is Christian, and I'm one of the pastors here at Victory Fort, and we want to welcome you to our um, 11 a.m. service. If you're joining us live stream, welcome as well. But we hope to see you next week here in the service itself. Now, we hope that this will not be your last if this is your first time. Um, we hope that you would, you know, especially next week. Next week is Mother's Day. And so we're preparing uh, something, something lang, okay. <laughs> for you. And so we hope that uh, you will uh, invite your moms next week. You know, before I go on with the Word of God, we've been uh, um, going through the series called The Gospel Demonstrated. And last week, we spoke about, you know, a uh, practical application of the gospel in us as Christians. Practical application is to somehow offer our talents, offer our services, offer our resources, you know, to help those that are underprivileged. And we presented to you last week um, five NGOs, um, that somehow um, some of our church members are a part of and we explain, you know, what they do, the ministry that they have, you know, with street children, with people who don't have access to water and electricity. And uh, many of you participated and enjoy, uh, actually uh, um, signed up for them. In fact, we said uh, it was reported to us about 800 to 1,000 people signed up. And so can we just give God a hand for that? Thank God for His grace. Um, to this church to be of help. And so, again, if you're interested more how to um, um, help those, if you're interested to know more about real life, just visit their website so that you will know more about the things that they do to help our underprivileged um, countrymen. Now, for today, uh, we're continuing, uh, we'll, we'll continue on a series called Gospel Demonstrated. But before I jump into that as a way of uh, uh, introduction, let me share with you an article that I read you know, recently. And this is about... Um, these two pieces of paper, these two inscriptions, and that made, you know, it was from 1922, and um, it was on auction last year, or, um, or around October, and um, sobrang mahal no nakuha nilang money. They, they raised a lot of money for this, and would you like to guess how much money they were able to raise, you know, um, uh, in the auction for these two pieces of paper? Okay, five pesos? No. <laughs> They were able to raise about 1.8 million pesos. Two people bought these two pieces of papers for um, 1.8 million in total, dollars rather, 1.8 million in dollars, because these are actual inscriptions or scribbles of Albert Einstein. Okay? And in this inscription, somehow we know him for the theory of relativity, we know him for a lot of scientific, um, you know, uh, uh, contributions that he had but this one is different because he now presents here the theory of happiness and um, you know the article goes you know um, um, it was for more than 1 million and this was what he said there in that piece of paper he said a calm and modest life brings more happiness than the pursuit of success combined with constant restlessness see that again a calm and modest life brings more happiness than the pursuit of success combined with constant restlessness. What an interesting theory from this man. And I believe, you know, there's a lot of biblical correlation, you know, with what he said in this particular statement. He's saying that a lot of people are pursuing happiness by pursuing success, but yet, Oftentimes, it is combined with constant restlessness. But the key to achieving real happiness, as he said, is a calm and a modest life. Being content with what you have and being happy what God, with what God has given you. Not being lazy, but still being ambitious and achieving things for God, but yet knowing when to stop. Knowing you know, when enough is enough. See, I want to highlight these two sets of words, pursuit of happiness and constant restlessness, because I believe this is a, an apt picture for many people in the world throughout the ages. It's like a hamster running, you know, inside this hamster wheel, and then paikot-ikot lang lang siya, paikot-ikot, and so hirap na hirap na yan, but yet paikot lang lang paikot. In fact, if you would see in this video, makita mo, diba, there are three uh, rats in the picture or in the video, there's a white, a black, and a brown one. And so, kawawa na lang yung brown and yung white kasi pagod na pagod na sila. Okay, so yung isa game pa rin. Okay? They could not keep up with the pace 
of the white one. And, you know, I believe this is like modern day picture of the world today. Because a lot of people are trying to achieve success. A lot of people are chasing, you know, for money. And a lot of people are chasing for happiness. Sometimes, you know, actually not sometimes, but a lot of times, people don't find what they're looking for. They do not receive happiness as they're as hoping, and they do not see, they receive the amount of money that they're well. In fact, some of them say money, somehow when they've achieved the top, they would say money is you know, gratifying, but it will never fully satisfy. Our text for today in James chapter um, 4 and 5, somehow James was able to name this issue, this problem, and he gave warning signs to avoid it. Also, the solution was there in James chapters 4 and 5. I like how the ESV translators entitled this segment. They said, this particular part is called the warning against worldliness. That um, insatiable pursuit for money, that quest for happiness in other means that this world is offering is what James and this theologian referred to as worldliness. Can you say worldliness? When we say worldliness, this is what it means. A godless life. A patterned life according to the standards and the systems of this world. Now, if I ask you, how many of you here would like to be termed, branded as a worldly person, I'm sure all of us would say we don't want that, right? We do not want to be worldly. We do not want to be branded as worldly. In fact, when we look at ourselves, we say, I am far from being worldly. In the Tagalog word, or in, in Tagalog dictionary, in the world, it means this, makamundo. We don't want this one, okay? We don't want to be called by our relatives, by our friends, na makamundo tayo, or we are worldly in the way that we live. But you know what? Not only don't we like that for our lives, not only do we not want that for our lives, God does not want us to be worldly and to be makamundo. 1 John 2, 15 and 16 says, Do not love the world or the things of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, the pleasures of the world, the pleasure that we receive, you know, that, that, that gratify our eyes, and also the pride of life, those are worldly things. And God does not want us to have those things. We don't want that. God does not want that. But do you know, it is actually possible that we are living in that. Is it possible for a Christian to say that they love God but still live a worldly lifestyle? Is it possible for us to think of ourselves as not worldly but yet when we would take an honest look of how we live our lives and we would ask the Holy Spirit to reveal things in us, is it possible that we are actually living this life? You see, one of the greatest, if not the greatest hindrances for the gospel to be proclaimed and demonstrated is a worldly kind of life. A lot of people got turned off with Christianity because when they look at the Christian, and they look at their lifestyle, and they look at the way they treat people, they say, you know, what's the difference between you and me? And so that is why we don't want worldliness to be with us. But here's the thing. Again, it's easy to detect it with others. It's hard to detect it on our own. And that is why it is important that we allow God to examine our hearts, to diagnose our hearts, and say, Lord, Am I, you know, affected or inflicted with this insidious virus, spiritually speaking? And so how do I deal with it as well? You know, I'm going to share with us for the remainder of our time, based on James chapter 4 and 5, the symptoms um, of worldliness as well as the solution for um, worldliness. The symptoms and the solution for this particular issue. In James chapter 4, we see here the first reason or the first symptom, and this is it. It's materialism. Can you say materialism? Again, 
Another word that we don't want to be associated with us, isn't it? We don't want to be branded as materialists. We don't want, okay, to be branded just like, uh, who's that song, singer again? Madonna said, material girl. We don't want to be the material girl. We don't want to be the material boy. We don't want to be the material, we don't want that for us, period. But then here's what he said in James chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. It's actually a struggle that all of us face. It's an infinite kind of war that happens in our hearts every day. James 4.1 says, What causes quarrels and causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? See, a lot of times we think of people as materialistic or people who are worldly by means of judging what they have and what they don't have. Some people immediately when they look at people and they see, wow, what an expensive bag you're holding. Wow, what Mercedes-Benz or BMW yung dinadrive niya. Sometimes, immediately we pass judgment and say, that person is materialistic. Is it? Is it? Because being materialistic and being worldly as we defined earlier is having a godless life. What if that person loves God so much? What if God, that person, God has blessed so much that what he has and what he's living is still below his means? Kung baga nga sa atin, yung mga ganong klase, piso lang. Barya lang sa kanila yon. It's not even an issue for them. And yet we brand them as materialists. See, if we will be honest to ourselves, materialism and even you know, worldliness is not just for those that have money, but even for those who don't have money. It just clothes itself in a different form. For some cases, we call it greed. For some cases, we call it poverty mentality. But both are the same. Both are saying, I want more. Both are saying, I don't have enough. And so, worldliness and materialism is not a question, it's not an issue of our possession. It's an issue of our passion. It's not an issue of what we have. It's an issue of the heart. It says there, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. It all starts with a desire. See, having a desire is good, right? Having a desire to achieve is good. Having a desire to win is good. Having a desire for your spouse is good. Desire per se is good. But yet when that desire is tainted, when we desire for things that we don't have, somehow sin creeps in our heart and it results to what it says there, murder. When we covet, when we covet, ang ibig sabihin po ng covet, di ba, is you are jealous that other people have the things that you don't have. Okay? When you look at Facebook and you see your classmates, when you see your batchmates, somehow they are successful now and still you're not as successful as them. And you try to think of things. You try to, what if I did this? What if I endeavor this? What if ganito na lang kayo? What if mag-asawa na lang kaya ako na? I mean, when you start thinking of these things, that's what the Bible says as coveting and desiring the wrong things. And when we allow that to happen, the danger of these kinds of thinking and desires is it ruins relationships. Quarrels and fights are present. Murder is there. In fact, when you look at the world today, we would hear stories like this. Killed over gold. My brother-in-law admits killing family of four in a row over inheritance of gold bars after they vanished from the bloodstained house in murder mystery that gripped France. Five children who murdered their parents. Can you imagine children murdering when an evil desire, when materialism creeps in and affects your heart, it can numb your judgment. It can numb your heart and can cause you to commit atrocious things. They say that even um, in this site, you know, um, the top reasons for divorce, number one is infidelity, but number two is the love of money. When greed comes in the way, when materialism comes in the way, it separates even the closest friends. I have counseled people were close friends before, but because of some misagree disagreements, financially speaking, they are now at odds with one another. 
people, um, good Christians, entering into a business together. And um, because of the lure of finances, now, parang hindi na magkaibigan. That's just the, you know, the destructive effect of money if it will not be checked. If it's unchecked, if it's un, somehow it's unguided by the grace of God. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Okay? You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Notice that this section somehow, um, he introduces or actually escalates the problem. It starts with a desire and then it leads to an action, but now there's a branding. The branding is it's about adultery. Wow, isn't it? You know, how come it's like that? There's an escalation that happened. ko ba worldliness lang or materialism now? Now it's being sit, you know, um, synonymous now to adultery, and we don't, you know, we know how grievous, you know, adultery is. We know the effects of that, and God is equating this one with adultery. You see, because God is pointing out a materialistic problem is not a you know a problem with what you have this worldly problem this materialistic problem is actually a problem with your heart and it's about your relationship with God Jesus himself put it in Matthew chapter 6 verse 24 no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other and he will be devoted to the one and despise the other you cannot serve God and money. Of all the things that God will equate himself with, of all the things that God would compare himself with and somehow say who is his or it's um, his closest competitor, he said it's money. It's not relationship. It's not a job. It's actually the love for money. Why? Because if we have money, sometimes we think that we are more secure and more significant. If we have money, we think that we're more important than the people around us. If we have money, we think that we are okay in the future. And God is saying those are the only things or those are the things that you can only and genuinely find in God. God wants our hearts. He knows that the closest competitor to our hearts is money. And that is why He is saying you cannot serve both God and money. This is not, you know, um, a practical issue. This is actually a relationship issue. Do we love God more than these things? That is the antidote to materialism. In fact, it can, several times it says it's about hating, it's about loving, it's about being devoted, but it's about having the desire. It's what desire. It's what you have in your heart. In fact, a good question that we can ask if we want to diagnose ourselves: What is it that our, our that what is it that our heart is most desiring? Ano ba yung hindi ka na nakatulog? Okay, pag iniisip mo yun. Is it the you know the what will happen to Avengers Four? <laughs> You've been researching so much on it, okay? You, you're, you're not satisfied with how it ended and you already want to know what will, what will happen, okay? Is it, you know, um, the latest cars available? Is it, you know, um, a relationship? Is it your business? Is it the status of your stocks? What is it that you think a lot about? Some say, we can define it by, you know, if you put blank is life, what is it not blank that we will put? I'm reminded, uh, uh, first time I had a car, first time I bought a car. And uh, uh, I bought a, an old Mitsubishi Galant, okay? And so um, this building was still not here. Um, it was still a parking space. Do you still remember that? That this, was, this used to be a parking space. The only building here was in phase one and so um, in that parking space it's all gravel and then um, in the middle of the gravel there will be rows of um, lamp posts and then with those um, little tra parang, ano, no? parang plastic that somehow um, uh, protects the uh, the lamp posts and so first time I bought a car first day after I handed out that 
you know, um, hard-earned money, okay, to the one who previously owned it. I drove it from um, Laguna. I bought it from Laguna, and I drove it here to BGC to show it to my friend because my friend works here. And so we looked at the car. Wow, it's so nice. It smells so good. like the details. And all. I was so, so, so proud of my new car. And so after I did that, they all went to their office, offices. And then when I drove it, when I, backed, when I backed up, you know what happened? You know, I hit one of the posts. First day. Unang araw pa lang nagasgasan agad yung kotse. I mean, it was so, so smooth. Ang ganda-ganda nung finish niya. And then nagasgasan agad. I, when I, um, you know, I exited the vehicle and I looked at it, it was that post and I didn't see it. I was shouting. I hope nobody heard me here. When I shouted at the parking area and I shouted, Lord, why? Okay, bakit? And somehow God just whispered to me, you know what? This is a test for you. Will you love me more than your galant? Will you love me more than this car? Will you make a big deal out of this scratch? I got convicted and I had it on. Buti na lang may rubbing compound, so you can rub it again. But then, what happens to our hearts? when the stock market crashes a bit? What happens to our hearts when, when we go to the ATM and we punch in those numbers? You know, the zeros are not there in the other side, are in the wrong side, you know, of the decimal point. <laughs> what happens to our hearts when that happens? That pictures, that shows to us what our heart is longing for, desiring for. God wants that. God wants us to have him in that place which leads us to the next point self-sufficiency materialism the other the other symptom is self-sufficiency it says there um, come now you say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring very confident matalino siguro alam niya predict niya yung mangyari sa stocks and so but yet, you don't know what will tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, He will live and do this um, or that. And it is, and as it is, rather, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. I'm reminded of the story, the parable that Jesus shared. The parable of the rich fool. Remember that? Um, he had so much. He was so. He had so much grain, and he doesn't have um, grain anymore. A uh, uh, place to store his grain, and so he. What he did is he tore down his old barns, old storage houses, and built bigger ones, and then put all of his produce in them. And he said, "You know, now I can relax. Now I can somehow uh, be stress-free because I am made for life." And Jesus said in that parable, you fool, you don't know. You think that you're secure. You think that you've made it. And you think that, wala na mga sayo. This night, your life will be taken from you. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. We don't know what's going to happen. We think that, you know, um, our success is because of us. God wants us to be reminded, you know what? It's just like this. Nisi Thanos, okay? Not Thanos, okay? But in a matter of an instant, instance, you know, everything can be taken from one sickness, one wrong decision, one economic crash in the world. Everything can be taken away from us. We think the more we have, we can be independent from God. Think again. That is why God reminded the people of Israel. You know, before they entered the promised land, he said, Beware, lest you say in your heart, as you're experiencing a land flowing with milk and honey, as you're experiencing the provisions of God, as you're experiencing the power that God has given you, as you're pre experiencing all the things, the blessings that God has given you, you might say, My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. Sometimes success is so intoxicating, we forget why we get there. We have to understand everything is by grace and everything is because of the generosity of God. There's this book, How the Mighty Fall, and um, a study of why companies 
um, you know, how some companies gave in and fell and why some companies never give in. One of the factors that they found out why companies, big companies, very um, established corporations would fall after, several, after some years. And this is one of the things that they found out. It's hubris, which is the excessive pride or self-confidence. Thinking that they're already there, that there, no one can beat them. And when they settle, that's when fall comes in. The same thing is true with us as individuals. When we think that because we have a lot of money, that because we have a nice job, that because we have a lot of stocks out there and we are already secure, think again. Pride causes the fall. Pride precedes the fall, as the Bible would put it. That is why it says there, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is today. Thirdly, it's about social injustice. Materialism, self-sufficiency, and when it somehow, it has desensitized our hearts, it causes us to treat people bad. It causes us to, you know, um, abuse other people and to treat people like they are not people. James chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. God, by the way, God is not after, or God is not against those who are rich, okay? God wants you to be rich. God wants you to be blessed. That's what the Bible says, but He does not want you to miss on the blesser. He wants you to be blessed so that you can be a blessing. And so here, James was addressing actually people who are rich, but those who are not believers, okay? Those who are somehow don't know how to handle their wealth. And he's saying, your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosions will be, will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up your treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you've kept back by fraud. How are we treating the people who are working for us? How do we treat our helpers? How do we treat our drivers? How do we treat our staff, our messengers, our janitors? Are we giving them the rightful and the commensurate payment that they deserve? That is why, thank God, you know, that um, Endo um, executive order was signed recently. And hopefully that will bring benefit to a lot of our countrymen. They're crying out against you and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Basically what he is saying, how did you receive your wealth? A lot of people, they received their wealth because of you know, abusing other people. If you have been a victim of abuse in the past, you know, in light of this one, guess what the Lord is saying? He is your vindicator. He will vindicate you. But yet, He is also giving us a warning. For those of us who have, are working with people, we have staff, we have laborers working for us, how do we treat them? The Bible says that they are made in the image, in the likeness of God. Are we treating them like that? That they are made in the image and the likeness of, uh, of our God. Are we giving them the right salary? See, giving a right salary, I realize this, is not about comparing, for example, you have a, um, um, a worker with you or you have a helper that, you, that works with you. If you compare what you give to what others can give, that will not be fair. Okay? But being fair in this one it's not about comparing the salary that you can give versus what other person. It's by giving the best that you can give given the situation that you are in. And so that is what God is looking at. He's not comparing, but He's ensuring are you giving the rightful wage that you're supposed to give, that you can actually give. And so with all of these symptoms, what then is the cure? How do we address if somehow we see and the Holy Spirit points out something in us about one of those three or two of those three or all of those three, what then is the cure? Thank God, this is what he said in James chapter 4, verse 6. But he gives more grace. Can you say grace? grace. He gives us more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, 
but gives grace to the humble. God's grace is always there. It's in effect. It is powerful enough to help us discern where we are and how we can go from where God, from where we are to where God wants us to be. In verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. When you say submit, it means to yield. When you say submit, it means to say you are under someone's authority. That is why, you know, in the past uh, month, we have um, all filed our income taxes, right? When we did that, our taxes, when we filed our taxes, we are saying we are under the sovereignty of the Republic of the Philippines because we're Filipinos. One application of that in church or in a relationship with God is through our tithes and offerings. When we give our tithes and offerings back to God, by the way, God owns it and we all ought to bring it back to Him. See, the Bible says that when you do that, you are declaring before God, Lord, I am believing you are my authority. I am declaring you are my provider. Not my business, not my work, not my salary, not my stocks. I am believing that my provision comes from you. And when you give your tithes and your offerings, you're saying to God, Lord, I am submitting. I am yielding my life, my family, back to you. I remember there's this guy who um, had a problem with tithing. And he said, Pastor, you know, when I was a student, I don't have a problem with tithing. I have a 1,000 allowance every month. And um, I, it's no question. It's, no, it's not even a struggle for me to give the 100. But how come now, now that I am working, I'm earning, you know, um, several hundred thousands of pesos, I am having a hard time giving the 10% of that. Can you pray for me? And so the pastor said, okay, I'm going to pray for you. Lord, thank you that you know my brother's struggle. Thank you that you know his situation. In order for him to have not a struggle anymore with this, can you give him the same salary that he used to have when he was a student? so that he will not have a problem. <laughs> Tithing is our way of declaring to God, He is Lord, not us. In verse 8a, eight, eight, it says, they're drawn near to God and He will draw near to you. When we say drawn near to God, I guess, um, as we said earlier, you know, this, this battle, this war that goes on within us, this poverty mentality perhaps that we have or greed, as we said, it's insidious. And somehow we don't know it already has crept in. And so the, the, the guide for us, the balance for us is always, you know, drawn near to God. Practically speaking, it's through prayer. It's by praying to God, Lord, when I do this with what you have given me, will you be pleased? Will you be honored? Somebody blessed you with five million pesos. Ask the Lord, Lord, is this 5 million pesos for me or something else? Because God wants us to be blessed, yes, but He wants us to be blessed so that we can be a blessing. I know we're all eager to get that next iPhone. We're all eager to get that next Samsung. But before we get there, wouldn't we ask ourselves first, wouldn't we pray to God first and say, Lord, what do you want me with this provision that you've given me? Lord, what do you want me to do with this money that you have given me. You see, every spending decision is actually a spiritual decision. Every spirit, He owns the 10%, yes, but the Bible says He also owns the 90%. And it's but right for us to consult Him in that 90%. Now, mind you, I'm sure a lot of people are saying already, no, ganun pala talaga si Lord, no? Let me just say, God is not a killjoy. In fact, he desires his children to be blessed and to enjoy his blessings. God wants you to enjoy. God wants you to have a nice life, yes. God wants you to have, be blessed, yes. But you know what? God does not want you to drown in the blessings and forget about him. And that is why it's important to always draw near, to always be close, to consult with him. Because when we are consulting with him, that's saying, you know, his opinion is more than the opinion of others or the opinion of my situation. R.C. Sproul put it this way, prayer does change things, all kinds of things. But the most important thing it changes is us. 
as we engage in this communion with God more deeply and come to know the one with whom we are speaking more intimately, that growing knowledge of God reveals to us all the more brilliantly who we are and our need to change in conformity to Him. Prayer changes us profoundly, which leads me to my last point. It says there, humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. To be humble means to have a right estimation of yourself. Not to somehow, um, minis- uh, parang alam yun, yung sobrang aani mo na lang sarili mo. Not to, um, you know, degrade yourself or not to escalate yourself, but yung tama lang. Having a right estimation of who you are in light of who God is. I like how D.L. Moody put it. He said, Christians should live in the world, but not to be filled with it. A ship leaves, uh, lives in the water, but if the water gets into the ship, she goes to the bottom. So Christians may live in the world, but if the world gets into them, they sink. All, I guess that aptly summarizes what we've been trying to say. God has called us to live in this world, but God wants us not to be off this world God wants us to be a blessing to this world God does not want us to sink in the systems of this world how do we counter worldliness if we see the symptoms of materialism of self-sufficiency or social injustice how do we counter that submit yourselves to God yield to Him draw near to God and humble yourself to Him how that applies i don't know but i trust this god will give you the steps god will give you how to apply this when you choose to listen to him and obey what he wants you to do you know there's this man that i know and i want to close with this story Um, he shared his testimony to us once and he shared um, when he somehow achieved success in his business he found himself having a lot of properties having several cars, having a nice, um, you know, um, house, nice family, yes, kids are in, um, you know, um, private schools, good bank account, and so he had all of these things, but yet he made a prayer. As a Christian, as a devout Christian, he said, Lord, you know my heart. And if any of these properties, these businesses, or these cars are becoming a hindrance from me to fully love you, Please take them away. You know, God answered his uh, his prayer. God took all of those things away. And then one time, as he was conversing with his wife and said, he, he chuckled and he realized, you know, the reason why we're here is because God answered my prayer. Because I prayed this, that if, you know, somehow the, all the things that we had are, would, you know, come in between me and God, I pray that God would take them away. And so the wife said, why did you pray that prayer? No, it didn't say, she didn't say that. But this guy said, but I'm smiling now because I know money is not an issue for me. Because I still love God, whether I have plenty or I have little. I still love God now. And I love God more now than when I had all the things that we had before. You know, God is good. God is a good father. You know what happened to him? All the things that he lost, after a year or two, he gained all of it back and even more. In fact, he said, in some areas, like yung cars yata na, God, instead of having just two, God gave them eight. And so, amazing how God provides, right? Amazing how God blesses His people. But what He's after is our heart. Who is at the center of our hearts? Who is enthroned in our hearts? That is what God is more concerned. He does not care about your money. He has a lot of it. He does not care about your possessions. He does not need all your possessions. But He's looking at your heart. And He's after your heart because He loves you. And He wants you to be intimate with Him. He wants all of us, all of us pastors, not exempt in this. He 
He wants all of us to love Him and love Him faithfully. Amen? Can we all stand up? Lord, we thank You for today. Holy Spirit, we know that You're here. And we know that You're moving. Lord, You are speaking to us even now and even a few moments ago, Lord, You were already speaking. And so, Lord, thank You that even now, Lord, we know that Your grace is here. Your grace for us to change, Lord. Your grace for us to align ourselves back again to You. Lord, today we thank You thank you for that grace you know as all heads are bowed and all eyes are closed you know i believe that god is you know here and he is bestowing upon us the grace to change and if somehow lord if if somehow we have um, seen or if somehow the holy spirit points in our hearts areas that we need to change particularly with this one maybe we realized Meron palang materialistic point of view pa doon. Meron palang materialism pa sa puso ko. There's still materialism in my heart. Or somehow you you think, or God has pointed, hey, you're thinking self-sufficient. You're thinking that you can sustain your life. You're not depending on me anymore. Or maybe there are instances that somehow we were not faithful in treating others. Meaning I believe that the grace of God is here for us to repent. And so, Lord, at this time, Lord, we come to you. Lord, for those of us who need to repent, Lord, today we make that step. And so, we, Lord, we say, Lord, we, we're sorry, Lord. Father, help us. Help us, Lord God, to counter this kind of thinking in our hearts and minds, Lord. If there's any materialistic thinking in us, Lord, I pray that you would remove it. Lord, if there's any self-sufficiency, God, I pray that you would remove it as well. Father, we pray. If we have been unjust with some people, Lord, we are sorry. And we pray that you would help us to make it right with them. Father, thank you that there's grace even now. Your word says you give grace to the humble. And even as we have humbled, Lord, right now, you are showering your grace. And let your grace be abundant indeed to all of us here today. This is our prayer, Lord. And as we dismiss today, Father, we thank you. Can you just lift up your hands to God right now? Father, we lift up our hands to you knowing that you are our God and you are a good Father. And so right now I pray, Lord, that even as you have recalibrated our hearts, Lord, right now I pray that you would release the blessings, Lord, to your people. Father, may you bless everyone, those who are believing, Lord God, for jobs. Lord, may you grant them the jobs that would honor you and bless you. Those who are believing for opportunities, Lord, may you grant them those opportunities that will honor and bless your name. Father, those who are looking, Lord God, for provision for this season, Lord, thank you that you will generously provide for them, Lord. Thank you as well that you will cause us to be blessed more than what we need because you want us to be a channel of your blessings to people. And so right now, I'm praying and I'm declaring in Jesus' name, May the blessings available in Christ be upon every family, every person here in this room, Lord. May you clothe and overflow, Lord God, in them. Bless them in every way so that we can bless the people that you want us to be a blessing with. This is our prayer, and we receive this by faith in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.